This is the story of the Tower of London, past and present. Welcome to Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress, the Tower of London. Let us talk about the executioner. Behold, the head of a traitor. With unique access to the Tower, this series will unlock its private as well as public life, revealing the hidden history of well-known stories and uncovering forgotten Tower secrets. More than anywhere else in Britain, these buildings have stood at the heart of history for over 900 years. The truth of what happened here is still being discovered, from executions with block and axe, to spies shot in the First World War. Fire! It has prisoners as familiar as Queen Elizabeth I, and as recent as World War II U-boat men. Even the craze did time in the tower. It still plays a ceremonial role, and is the high security home of the most famous jewels in the world. The tower is a magnet for millions of tourists. It was built for war, a castle with its own golden keys. And it was as a powerful fortress that it began its life. In 1066, William the Conqueror invaded England. Fearful that the hostile Saxon population would revolt, he vowed to build a fortress so mighty that it would dominate the people of London and destroy any hope of rebellion. A chronicler at the time wrote that fortifications were erected against the fickleness of the huge and fierce population, for he perceived that to crush the Londoners under heel was his first objective. William's stronghold took more than 20 years to build. Over 900 years later, it is still standing. The Tower of London was originally conceived as a military fortification, designed above all else to resist attack. The tower had the very best that medieval engineering could provide, and the basic layout has changed little since those times. With a massive keep surrounded by two concentric walls, reinforced by 20 towers and protected by a moat. Today, the tower remains one of the most secure buildings in Britain. In almost a thousand years, the tower's defences have rarely been tested. But there was one spectacular failure. In 1381, a mob of English peasants rebelling against excessive taxation stormed the tower and rampaged through the royal apartments. At the bloodthirsty climax of their revolt, the mob turned their fury on the man they held responsible for their taxes, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was dragged from safety and brutally beheaded beyond the fortress walls here on Tower Hill. The Archbishop's name was Simon Sudbury. The gruesome legacy of this historic event can be found at St. Gregory's Church in Simon's hometown of Sudbury. The story of how this 600-year-old head came to rest in the vestry of St. Gregory's is a lesson in how even the most impregnable fortress can be breached. At the time of the peasants' revolt, King Richard II was only 14 and relied heavily on his advisers. No one was closer to him than Simon Sudbury, the Lord Chancellor of England and Archbishop of Canterbury. 
In order to pay for a costly war with France, the king turned to Sudbury for help. It was Simon's misfortune that the king, after a while, needed considerable funds raising and that he, Simon, dreamt up the idea of a poll tax. Every person in England, be they peasant or earl, paying the same amount towards the tax. The peasants of Kent and Essex were outraged at the injustice of the poll tax, and in July 1381, led by Wat Tyler, they marched on London to vent their anger. Young King Richard II was not at the tower when the mob attacked, but his mother, Queen Joan, was in her chamber. <laughs> the Queen Mother escaped unharmed. While in the chapel of St. John, at the heart of the fortress, Archbishop Simon Sudbury prayed for salvation. In the Middle Ages, the royal person was regarded as being divinely appointed and that, in fact, to the idea of um, deposing a reigning monarch was regarded as deeply shocking. When people have a grievance against royal authority, they tend to focus it not on the purpose of the reigning monarch, but on the ministers around them. By tradition, any man who sought sanctuary in a church would be safe from harm. But Sudbury's reputation meant that no one was going to respect his sanctuary. It is said that it took seven or eight blows to sever Simon's head from his body. And if we look at the back of the head, you'll see that that story is borne out. This has been hacked away. It's not the clean blow that it would have been if, if an expert executioner had done the job. Stored in a cool, dry environment of a church vault for over 600 years, Simon's head has been naturally mummified. There's the bone, you see, but this is the skin, look, uh, which still adheres. When he was beheaded, the head was taken and put, as it were, in triumph on a spike on London Bridge. And whilst his body as Archbishop, was taken straight back to Canterbury and buried. His head was left on London Bridge for three days, and it was sent back to Sudbury, his birthplace, under armed escort. And it's been here ever since. The verger of this church and sexton, the man who had to dig graves here during the 19th century, uh, saw Simon as a way of making the odd penny or two for himself. And whenever the sexton went to dig a new grave, he would find parts of bones and particularly teeth from previous burials. And he would make sure that from the teeth in his tin, Simon had a full set. And when tourists came, he would offer them a memento of their visit. He'd say, would you like one of Simon's teeth? He would take it out and give it to them, and they, doubtless very grateful, would give him half a guinea or so. And as soon as the tourist was out of the door, out came the tin from his pocket, and he popped another tooth back in. We don't make money selling teeth to tourists these days, and Simon is toothless. But I always think it looks as if he's smiling. When the peasants rampaged through London, 
The fortress they attacked was essentially the castle built by Edward I, England's greatest stronghold builder. Even more impressive then than it is today, Edward's citadel boasted a series of sophisticated defences on a scale which has never been surpassed. Obstacle after obstacle was built to ensure that the king's enemies would never dare to attempt a frontal assault on his stronghold. Edward completed the work on his masterpiece in 1320, 61 years before the rebellion. At the time, the fortress was state-of-the-art, a magnificent essay in castle building which was considered to be invulnerable to attack. So how on earth did a mob of peasants, ill-equipped and ill-disciplined, manage to penetrate the defences of the greatest castle in England? In 1381, the Tower of London was overrun by a mob of angry peasants. Yet this was the time when the castle was at its most formidable, with fortifications even more extensive than today that had been perfected over 60 years earlier by Edward I. Edward I is one of the great castle builders of English history and the Tower of London is his first real essay in it and to my mind it's still pretty well unparalleled. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It does um, so many of the things that other castles just try to do and don't get to do them on a bigger scale to better quality and just so much of it. The core of Edward I's castle remains to this day. But in the 14th century, the fortress was even more impressive. The moat was 150 foot wide and 10 feet deep, and there was a massive defensive complex guarding the approach to the tower. The first line of defense was an imposing structure which no longer exists, the Lion Tower. The name Lion Tower itself is quite interesting. This is probably not part of the castle's defenses, but quite early in its history, certainly we know this from the, the 14th century, this was as the name would suggest, the home of the king's collection of lions, the part of the royal menagerie, his collection of exotic animals. And kings of England particularly liked having lions. Lions are, they have significance for the heraldry of the royal arms of England. But if you imagine coming in to visit, that would be pretty impressive as well, that suddenly you've got to walk past a series of cages that are full of ravening um, wild animals of this kind. So I say not part of the castle's defences, but again, a little bit dispiriting probably, I would have thought. On entering the Lion Tower, any attackers would find themselves in a small courtyard, an enclosed space where they would make easy targets for the king's archers. It's a bit like an airlock. They can check you out in here because presumably there's a gate on one side of it and certainly a gate on the other side of it before you get into the Tower of London. So it's a holding area. And again, you know, if you're not the right sort of person, they kill you. The next line of defence was the middle tower, equipped with a drawbridge which could be retracted in times of need. Although the original is no longer there, the pit beneath it contains vital clues that explain how the drawbridge worked. Drawbridges are quite early as far as we can see, and of course we all think of them as a sort of Errol Flynn kind of thing, you know, they're hinged uh, down at the bottom at the foot of the tower and someone you know, pulls on a heavy chain and it just swings upwards against that. The ones we've got here at the Tower of a slightly different kind, we, sometimes they're described in the documents as turning bridges, and that's because they're actually pivoted slightly off centre, and they've got counterweights at one end. These three slots here are um, the curving chases or grooves or whatever channels in which the three swinging counterweights of the bridge itself would go. Once you release the counterweights, whoomph, they swing down quite fast and the bridge just flips up and opens this dirty great pit right in front of you and hopefully you fall into it. But I mean, what they're there for, the principle is the same. It's, it's to open up and to suddenly destroy the roadway in front of you that you were just about to ride or run across um, and hold you up long enough for people to be able to shoot you and you'll be standing still a bit like a lemon. 
As well as the drawbridge, the combination of a portcullis and gigantic oak doors created a formidable obstacle, which could hold any attackers at bay. While they're holding us here, the Edward I defenders have something they can do. In particular, there are arrow loops there and there in the side of the gate passage, and I'm in a perfect position now to be shot. So things are not looking good for me. Other things I might try and do, perhaps I might try and burn my way through a portcullis because it would substantially be made of wood. Well, they have a defence against this as well, I think, probably. There are these three holes in the arch above us called murder holes, we call them. And tradition always says this is for boiling oil and things like that. Well, difficult to boil oil to a sufficient quantity and sufficient heat upstairs. And I think it's far more likely that this is for chucking down um, water or something like that to try and actually douse a fire that I might set here. Any attacker lucky enough to survive the western approach would think that they had penetrated the tower, but in fact it was just the beginning of Edward I's amazing defences. And now, here we are, we're inside the Tower of London, we've made it, except that, as you can see, we haven't made it by any stretch of the imagination, because this Edward I castle, this is a concentric fortress, it doesn't have one wall, it has two walls, and you see inside us, we've only got through the outer curtain wall, inside us is the far taller inner curtain wall, and it's only inside there that the main buildings of the castle are located. While it was Edward's father, Henry III, who built the inner wall around the White Tower, Edward's genius was to create defence in depth. With the addition of a second curtain wall, defenders of the stronghold could rain arrows down on their assailants from the inner wall, even if the outer defences had failed. Well, this is a view of the tower that no one, but no one ever gets to see. This is, um, we're standing on the roof of some of the yeoman warders' houses, which are built into Edward I's outer curtain wall. But it's the best place that I know of to see um, one of the features of the castle from the development of Edward's father, King Henry III, um, who it was who was responsible for most of the inner curtain wall. Along the length of it, there are evenly spaced towers, and the principle of this is twofold. One is um, to provide yourself with strong points in the defences where defenders can actually again make life difficult for anyone attacking the castle. The other thing about it is you see is because they're evenly spaced you as, can, as the king who can build something that's so regular will also look a bit like a control freak and that seems to be what they want to do. And we know that when Henry started building this sort of thing the Londoners looked at it with great horror because they saw this very, very sort of orderly castle going up and thought, well, this isn't really going to be to our good at all. And they actually made complaints to Henry, but he was so proud of what he was doing. He was in very bullish mood saying, I will do as I please and I will build my castle strongly. The idea that the fortress could have a psychological effect on the population of London was established more than 200 years earlier when William the Conqueror built the White Tower. It took 20 years to construct and was 90 feet tall with walls 15 feet thick. Now dwarfed by the modern skyline, for 500 years it was rivaled only by St Paul's as the tallest building in London. But in the 11th century, the White Tower was not all that it seemed. The roof we're standing on, which is right at the top of the building, in fact is a lot higher than the roof that the Normans originally built. And we think that probably they built a stone outside that looked absolutely enormous and was intending to be intimidating but actually only had a building filling the bottom three quarters of it that the roof was a lot lower down so there was a whole top story that actually didn't have a building inside it and I think that's exactly this to make the Saxons of London really think twice about um, trying to do anything about any grievances they might have felt and anyone sailing into London on the River Thames perhaps thinking to uh, try for the Kingdom of England themselves would also be tempted to go back home and try again next year when they felt a little bit braver. The tower was still believed to be impregnable in the 14th century. But despite the defences, in 1381, the peasants mounted their successful assault. The fact that the peasants seem not to have had too much difficulty getting into the Tower of London is a bit of a mystery, considering that I've just been saying that the castle was built to be impregnable and peasant-proof. Um, unless you're being heavily shot at by other things, which there's no suggestion that the peasants were heavily armed with anything more than agricultural implements and the odd sharp tool. I 
think there really has to be the suggestion that there was collusion between the people defending the gates and the peasants. Well, I think the culprits in this instance were some of my predecessors. When the peasants attacked the Tower of London, they had to break through at least six gates, three drawbridges and two portcullises before they'd even reached the inner wall of the fortress. That is, of course, unless someone let them in. The peasants' revolt, of course, was against the old poll tax, so we never seem to learn from history, do we? Uh, and, of course, the warders of those days were not quite as dedicated as the warders of today. And we know that a lot of yeomen in those days, although they took the post of yeoman warder, they never actually performed the duties. They would actually palm off a lot of their duties to some of the young boys, the, the people they hired on the street. And they were the ones who were actually guarding the tower. And of course, being peasants, men of the street themselves, they were quite sympathetic to Wat Tyler and his crowd. And so when the peasants' revolt started, they were part of it. And they opened the gates to let the revolters in. So the mighty stronghold did have a weakness, a trail. By creating a policy as unpopular as the poll tax, there was nothing that could protect Simon Sudbury from the enemy within. When order was restored in London, the tower was once again a secure fortress. But this was not to last. A new development came to Britain which changed warfare forever. Firepower. Primitive guns began to appear in the 14th century. This vase gun, for example, was really just an automatic archer, firing one large arrow at a time. Hardly a weapon to combat a fortress. Medieval castles were more likely to be attacked by siege engines, catapulting anything from rocks to diseased animals deep into the castle. The White Tower, its walls some 90 feet high, was perfect to resist this kind of attack. But its virtue was to become its weakness. By the 15th century, gun technology had leaped ahead. The arrival of the cannon meant that walls could now be blasted through. The medieval fashion for tall, intimidating towers was outdated, and those who dwelled within were left vulnerable. This gigantic weapon was used to devastating effect in the siege of Constantinople in 1453. It was the first time that guns had been used decisively in siege warfare, and it spread panic throughout the royalty of Europe. At the Tower of London, the military engineers knew they'd have to adapt their medieval castle fast if it was to remain effective in the age of artillery. Well, the, the building we're standing in front is called the Bywood Postern, and it is, in fact, a purposely built gun tower, probably dating from the late 15th century. You can see these small openings, designed, in fact, to take a gun, a cannon, mounted inside the building. And further up the walls, to the right of the window up there, you can see another one, which shows that at different levels of the building, the builders provided openings from which heavy guns could be used. Well, we're now standing inside the um, Bywood Poston. What you see before you is a very well-preserved gun port. We're talking of a relatively small iron gun that would have been strapped to a wooden bed and the whole thing pushed forward and poked through the opening at the end. By later standards, this is very, very crude indeed. There's very little room to manoeuvre the gun around, very little opportunity to even see where the gun's, you know, trained on. And, of course, if the, if the guns were used, this, this area would have filled up with smoke and made the whole thing almost impossible to operate in. But nevertheless, you are seeing the first attempts to try and accommodate guns within a building, so it's been purposely designed into the building. The tower continued to modernise its defences throughout the age of artillery, but it would never achieve the security and dominance it had as a medieval fortress. 
Today, the tower features modifications from every era since its conception. Now there's a plan to uncover a medieval defense which no one alive has ever seen. Many of the medieval defences that once protected the Tower of London have been modified, or have disappeared. But the Byward Tower has hardly changed in 700 years, and still harbours a portcullis. Suspended above the gateway, the last time it was lowered was in 1905. Nobody knows exactly how old it is. Sir Jeremy Ashby has enlisted the help of the Oxford Archaeological Unit to put a precise date on this piece of ancient machinery. I think there's absolutely no doubt from the general appearance of it, we are dealing with a piece of medieval machinery. Right. This is what medieval machines were like. They were very carefully put together, however rough they may look. Mm. They were carefully constructed of timber. The parts that mattered had iron strengthening or iron parts. Well, I shall... If there's a possibility this might be part of the end of the first building, I shall hitherto treat it with a lot more respect than I <laughs> formerly had done. Hey, you have a look down there. This is the bit where I drop the torch and show the visitor's head. There's rather ferocious iron spikes down below. Yeah. I you assume what it would do is go into an earthen surface down below. Yeah. You know, and it would be, of course, you couldn't take a battering ram to it, you couldn't set fire to it. Uh, because well, you it could would try and set fire to it, but then we, there's another line of defence behind that, these murder holes. Good gracious, Smith, aren't they deep? They're wonderful. Little is known about the portcullis, as most of it is hidden from view inside the Byward Tower, leaving only its spikes exposed. That's really weird. Just above the central spike. What is that thing? Cat flap? It's not a cat flap. Well, it's got the same type of construction. Yeah. It's oh. not for the cat, I tell you, it's not. There must always have been cats in the town. Oh, Julian. Jeremy will need to have the portcullis lowered before they can work out its age and identify its peculiar features. One thing is for certain, however, there have always been cats in the Tower of London. Geoffrey Parnell has the evidence. There are all sorts of oddities round and about here, um, but perhaps one that I might draw your attention to is this mummified black cat. Um, this is a, an animal that was found in the foundations of the, of the White Tower in 1930. Um, there's very little doubt that it, it was buried in the building while it was being constructed in the 11th century. Well, the tradition, as remains to this day, is that if a black cat walks in front of you, it's, it, you know, it's a, a good omen. The black cat is associated with good things. And therefore, presumably, the belief was, all these hundreds of years ago, that if you buried an animal like that in the, the building, it would bring good luck to the building. Meow. <laughs> For the first time in almost a century, the Byward Tower portcullis is about to be lowered. The plan of action is to take it down as gently as possible, and at the moment the chaps are erecting a new hoist mechanism. We're not going to risk doing anything with the historic hoist mechanism that's there. Yeah. I'm deeply nervous. This is potentially a very, very old artifact. It may be in a quite fragile state. <coughs> that's why we're doing it, to see exactly how fragile. And if we find, the moment it starts to move, that the structure is experiencing stress, then we will stop. Um, but it's also ridiculously heavy, and it has iron spikes on the bottom. So it's never something to be undertaken lightly. This is definitely a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Um, no one alive has ever seen this down. We've been calculating the height of the Fort Cullis, which is 11 and a half feet, which is precisely the height of this roof. But with this screen here, we reckon it couldn't have been got in in the last 400 years or so. So we're beginning to think this really must be the original portcullis. And it's a very exciting moment to see it going down. I think I want to see the spikes appearing through the arch down the stairs. Okay. A 
it's just incredible. I mean, just to see something that you know no one alive has ever seen before is, is you know, very you know, sort of dramatic. We've been having very serious discussions about this cat flap. We can see now it's a round hole, it's a completely round hole. It's got an iron bolt coming down and it's got an iron crossbar behind it, so it's quite well protected. Um, it's either a cat's or cannon. <laughs> it's certainly letting something dangerous out. If there's one member of staff at the tower who can explain the mystery, it's Geoffrey Parnell. Very interesting. I think now we can see it, it's not a cat flap. I think it's cannon size. Yeah. I think bearing in mind the height of the spikes, it's exactly the right height for a cannon to be on a, you know, a shallow wheeled bed. No, I think that, that's absolutely fascinating and uh, nothing quite like it I've seen before, but um, yeah. I don't think we imagined that it would be opaque. Yeah, well, it is boarded, which yeah. is very peculiar. I mean, yeah. when do you ever see a boarded portcullis? Yeah. And I think it's all to do with protecting the people that are operating the gun. Yeah, but it's only the bottom. Here we go. We're getting to the. Look here, here's the. We're getting to the opening. Exactly, yeah. and yeah. It, it, it's boarded right. to the point where a musketeer would would stand be, and exactly. Fire yeah, the... it's a barricade, really, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, you, you um, hide that, behind it. And yeah. they did use boarding for musket proofing. But of course, this could all be modifications to what is basically a medieval portcullis. I'm I sure. So. The evidence suggests the cat flap was in fact a cannon port, whilst the lower part of the original medieval portcullis was boarded up to provide cover for soldiers armed with handguns. This bulletproof. Yeah. <laughs> for Geoffrey Parnell, it's confirmation of a theory he's been harboring for some time about how the tower's medieval arrow loops have been modified. I think that now explains what that is. What, that iron ring in the mm. wall? Yeah. I think that would have been, I mean, this is obviously a, a medieval arrow slit yeah. and they blocked it top and bottom. And those are little holes for handguns to be poked through, they would have infilled that part and just kept that open. You've got a very quirky, I think, 16th century gun port. If you can imagine that fully lowered, um, the gun would have been sort of at this level and clearly intended just to spray the causeway. So anyone that had got onto the causeway would have just been, you know, pelted with shrapnel and bits of flint or anything else they would have packed into it. A death trap, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, late medieval, early Tudor alterations are all quirky, all rather crude, difficult to date it, but I'd be very surprised if it's anything later than about 1550. It's just too crude. Of course, if anyone had managed to get a gun down there, they would have just blasted the whole thing away and it would all have been a waste of time, but um, full marks for trying. I feel fantastic that it's down without a hitch. I shall feel even more fantastic over a drink this evening when it's back up in its place and pegged in position. But it's been a fantastic day. I think that a lot of the portcullis, the grid structure, could well be the one that was originally put in by Edward I. So in a sense, everyone's happy. We've got something that, you know, looks like, now starts to look like what a portcullis ought to look like, but we can see how it's adapted to go with the times. And that's exactly what the Tower of London's defences always do. You know, at the heart of it's a medieval castle, but they always make just the alterations they need to keep it up to speed. Although it's been here for almost 700 years, the Byward Tower portcullis is not the oldest surviving defence. From the very beginning, the towers always had a garrison ready to defend its walls from attackers. Today, there is little threat of enemy assault, but there remains a contingent of guards. We are F Company of the Scots Guards. And our sort of primary role is um, public duties. So at the Tower of London here, or also at Buckingham Palace and St James's Palace. Um, the rest of the army actually is slightly jealous, I think, because the discipline that's required is something that everybody else in the army is jealous of because discipline being a great thing in the army and it's just so obvious that the troops doing ceremonial stuff are probably the most disciplined in the army and have such pride in their um, regiments. Obviously I've been guardsmen we've got very very high standards. We want the guardsmen when they go out on ceremonial sentries to look their best in front of the public all the time. So when the, when the guys have obviously put their kit on sometimes when you do it you do get dirty marks on your buff belt. So we, we check them over, touch his buff belt up, 
make sure his great coat and the, and the rest of his equipment's all s set up correctly. He's, uh, he's wearing it correctly, and it's looking its best before he goes out on ceremonial sentry. I can see detail that you won't see. And the detail that I see, I will pick up on. I mean, and you'll probably not even notice it, but uh, we do. There are two sentry posts that we man uh, during the day here. One is outside the Waterloo block, um, which is where the entrance to the jewel house is. And his job is essentially to make sure people don't go past a certain line. And the other one uh, guards the Queen's house. And his is the silent position. And he doesn't sort of bang his feet and stamp his feet in, he does it all silently. And when when reporting that all's well, when he's being inspected. Again, he does that just above a whisper, so as not to disturb the Queen if she were in residence. It can look simple, but that's because we rehearse so much, and they do it all the time, and they make it look, good, look easy because they're good at it. Um, if you took your average Blake off the street, he would A, probably fall over within 20 minutes because he wouldn't know how to stand at attention, and B, he'd just look very you know, unsmart and not at all what we're trying to achieve. Um, I'm just getting dressed in order to go out on patrol to check the check the sentries. Check they've been properly briefed and they're happy about what's going on. Because they're so open to the public, you get gawked out a bit and photographs taken, but you don't really notice them actually. And the sentries quite enjoy them just because it gives them something to look at and people to sort of keep them entertained when they're just standing there. Captain Mace performs a regular inspection to ensure his sentries stay alert whilst on duty. No one post all as well, sir! Thank you. How long have you been on uh, Sly for? Since 2 o'clock, sir. Who would you salute if you saw him coming past? The Queen, Queen Mother, uh, Duke of Wellington, Duke of, Duke of York, uh, and Duke of Kent, and uh, the Governor of uh, the Tower of London. Excellent. And many tourists start? Uh, yes, sir. Very busy. Lots of photographs taken? Nice right here. Excellent. Happy enough? Okay, dress back slightly. Dress back. Bring your right foot forward slightly. Oh yeah. Still. Okay. Okay. Happy. Right. right. Thank you very much. Right, See you later. On. I'm still with so I don't want to get. You, know, you occasionally get a, a tourist who's particularly keen to have their photograph taken, or something who come you know too close and start to disturb them. And they're usually quite good at uh, repelling the tourists, let's say. Make way for the Queen's Guard! Make way! Really? Quick! Mad! If the tourists get in the way, then they are told in no uncertain terms to get out of the way. We don't, we're not here as a tourist attraction, so we don't sort of put up with any, any nonsense from them. As well as guarding the crown jewels and repelling tourists, the Tower Guard take part in one of the greatest institutions of the Tower. Halt! Who comes here? The keys. Whose keys? Queen Elizabeth's keys. The Ceremony of the Keys. Much of modern life at the Tower of London is determined by ancient traditions. Perhaps the most extraordinary ritual of all takes place every single night of the year, behind closed doors. The, uh, the ceremony of the keys is an, is an ancient tradition. It's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years without a break. I don't think there's been a single night that it hasn't happened for three to four hundred years. I think we can safely say it is the longest running uninterrupted ceremony in the world. We carry out the ceremony every single night of the year, including Christmas, uh, when we don't have any uh, visitors. But even though we have no visitors on Christmas Day, we still carry out the ceremony. The actual ceremony is conducted either by myself as the Chief Yeoman Warder, or by my deputy, the Yeoman Jailer, or the four Yeoman Sergeants who assist us. Uh, and our task is to ensure that all the gates of the tower are locked and secured each night at 10 p.m. Each of those that conducts the ceremony of the keys, uh, we have our own start time. 
but the finish time must be spot on 10 p.m. Me personally, I would leave the Byward Tower at 9.53 and 35 seconds, knowing full well that the speed I march at, it's ample time for me to pick up my escort, lock all the gates, get back to where the main body of the guard are on the Broadwalk steps. They will then present arms under the command of the officer of the guard. I will then take my two paces forward, raise my bonnet and proclaim, God preserve Queen Elizabeth. And as I do that, the clock chimes 10. There is hard evidence that the ceremony of the keys is the world's longest unbroken military tradition. Its roots can be traced back to the reign of Edward III, 40 years before the Peasants' Revolt. There are very real suggestions in documents from the Middle Ages, from the 14th century, of something that sounds a little bit like it could have later have evolved into the ceremony of the keys, which is to say that some formalised way of making sure that the fortress is locked at night and unlocked in the morning. One of the earliest ones that I've ever seen is from 1336, when there was a very real invasion scare. Afraid that a French fleet could sail up the Thames and attack the Tower of London, King Edward III gave an instruction to the constable of the tower. Order to cause the gates of the tower to be closed from the setting of the sun to the rising of the same. It was an order the constable should have taken more seriously, as he discovered to his cost when the king returned from the wars unannounced one night in 1340. He arrives, according to um, various versions, by boat, probably coming into Traitor's Gate, whatever, and arrives to find that the gate is completely unlocked, and he manages to get back into the Tower of London, notwithstanding that he is the king, completely unchallenged. To arrive at the Tower of London and find that the water gate is open, that anyone with a boat can come in, I think really is very much the equivalent of coming home to find a sign hanging up saying, the key is under the mat, please let yourself in. And so for the next few days, you get a very sad procession of embarrassed um, officials, including the constable of the Tower of London, coming to pay their attendance to the king and being unceremoniously thrown into prison. The formal locking of the tower gates has been enforced ever since Edward's unexpected return in 1340. The one time that the ceremony of the keys was interrupted was during the Second World War, when there was an air raid on London and a number of incendiary bombs fell on the old Victorian guardroom just as the chief yeoman warder and his escort were coming through the bloody tower archway. The shock and the noise of the bombs falling actually blew over uh, the escort and the chief yeoman warder and they stood up, dusted themselves down and carried on. And we actually have a letter uh, from the officer of the guard apologising to King George VI that the ceremony was late and also a reply from the king which says that the officer was not to be punished because it was due to enemy action that the ceremony of the keys was actually late. The one thing about it is the pride in continuing with such an age-old tradition. So that pride never leaves you, it is part of you and we are part of living history so we must keep it going, we must keep that sense of pride in our history and traditions. The chief yeoman warder performs the ceremony of the keys himself at least a hundred times a year. But for the soldiers of the garrison, it's a much less frequent honour. Well, I'm just getting dressed just now to go out and do the challenge for the first time of the ceremony of the keys. I am just hope I don't mess up for the first time. There's a lot of people out there watching me, see how I do. So hopefully I'll perform in front of everybody. To ensure the ceremony happens on time and without a hitch, Tom Sharp always holds a dress rehearsal several hours before the ceremony itself. Guardsman David McCalley is in the spotlight, issuing the challenge in tonight's ceremony. Halt there and turn left. Okay, you'll then see us advancing along Water Lane here. When we get to level with that little light that's on the steps, can you see it? Yes, sir. That's where you give the challenge. Okay, sir. And the challenge in a nice, crisp, clear voice, HALT! Once we've halted, who comes there? I'll answer the keys. Whose keys? Queen Elizabeth's keys. And you stand and say, pass Queen Elizabeth's keys and all is well. Okay, sir. Okay? Any questions? No, sir. Good. This is my first time doing the ceremony of the keys tonight. And before that, I think the last time I was at the tower was 
for about 15 years ago as a as a tourist essentially um, so it's been quite fun and interesting to come back especially now I'm sort of involved and part of it it's uh, now it's about 10 to 10 the escort to the keys are in position and when they step off to go and lock the gates then we step off to uh, to just secure the inner inner gate as it were and we're waiting for them to come back and it usually takes four or five minutes and they get back just before 10 o'clock it's happened at exactly the same time for however many hundred years apparently it's been late once but um, that caused such a stink that no one's ever dared to be late again so it's quite important we get there at the right time David must assume his position at the sentry post before the ceremony begins he must remain on guard until it's time for him to issue the challenge, which begins the formal part of the ceremony. While he's waiting, Tom Sharp collects his armed escort and marches off to secure the gates of the tower. Escort to the keys. Right on cue, Guardsman McCalley takes his position, ready to issue the challenge. Now Captain Mace and the remainder of the Tower Guard must assemble on the Broadwalk steps in preparation for the final part of the ceremony, the saluting of the Queen's keys. and escort, present arms. God preserve Queen Elizabeth. Amen. Performed every night for more than 600 years, the Ceremony of the Keys is a reminder of just how important this great fortress once was. And so, once again, the Tower of London is secure for the night. On the next episode, A Prison Fit for a Queen, from Elizabeth I to torture and escapes, the story of doing time at the tower. <laughs>